Alrighty, well, hi everybody. Uh, well, this uh, this video here is gonna is gonna be kind of a makeup video. I tried doing this very same thing like this morning, but it just came out all kinds of awful. Um, I'm just hemming and hawing, screwing up my words, um, saying things that made like no sense at the time when I or that made no sense at all when I played it back. So I was basically just left left sitting there like like why or, but eventually I ended up having to trash the video just because of how, how bad it was so so this is going to be my second chance video um, I'm just going to go ahead and do another one of these so and so basically what I'm doing here is for the most is in a word rehearsed so but it's a it's a video called Physical Therapist Debunk 14 Exercise Myths. Um, I did something like this a few months ago when Athlete and X kind of did kind of did one kind of did a did a variation of this. But uh, this is something I like to do from time to time. Um, I just like to I just like to grab videos and then do commentary on them. So, so here goes. Working out tones your muscles. Oh, oh and I'm, I'm probably not going to say anything through this intro part here because these, these are basically just, they'll, they'll say these later. So. <laughs> I can't even say that with a straight face. The best way to burn fat is on an empty stomach. Uh, yeah, go ahead and crinkle that up and throw that one away as well. Running will destroy your knees. Even though um, I hate running personally, it will um, not destroy your knees. My name is Dr. Stacy Morris. I am the owner of the PhysioFix, which is in Phoenix, Arizona. I have been practicing physical therapy for six years now, and my specialty is working in sports, but specifically working with strength athletes and gymnasts. Hi, my name is Dr. Wesley Wong. I am a physical therapist, and I have been practicing for about five and a half years now. I personally specialize in ACLs and working with high school and college level athletes, and I work at Healthy Baller. Today, we're debunking fitness myths. Oh, oh and one moment. And throughout this video, I'm gonna have me a, I'm gonna have me a V8 energy drink, orange pineapple flavored. And I'm almost done with this one, so got another one as backup. I was on the right your window. knees should never pass your toes when squatting. Um, I'm trying to remember what I said about this this morning. No, 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 because um, you're um, you're kind of restricting your form on that. Okay, that's what they were. That's what they were saying this morning. Um, it, it do it naturally. There is no, there is no strict requirement for squatting. Now, I've been, um, uh, I've been doing manual labor and heavy lifting for probably about 30 years now. So there's, it's whatever, whatever you're comfortable with. As far as something, something strict like this, if you try to shoehorn yourself into, say in this example here, keeping your knees from going past your toes, you're, you're actually setting your up, you're setting yourself up for injury when you're doing that. Again, when you're forcing yourself into a specific form, then uh, that's that's where the injuries happen. And you should just squat naturally. And as one who's had his fair share of injuries, I can definitely attest to this. Because in my line of work, you have to, oftentimes I have to contort my body in certain ways and stuff to do whatever it is I need to do. And that's where the injuries come from. Forcing yourself to put your to be in a position that you don't want to be in. So, so yeah, definitely a myth. Thanks. And this is something that I maybe pushed a little bit early in my career when I didn't understand everything. You should allow your body to move naturally. And if you limit that, you actually add more stress, as we've yep. known through literature, to Been your there. hips and your low back. So to limit that movement is just absurd to me. And I feel like that myth needs to die now. You think about daily things that we do. Let's take away strength training beyond that. 
you go down the stairs. Your knees go past your toes. When you play your sport, do you ever think about your knees being past your toes? Yeah. And the answer is 100% no. And Stacey, for you, you were a gymnast. Like, when you did your jumps and flips and landings, I can guarantee you were never like, oh no, I, my knees cannot go past my toes. You're absolutely correct. So now we see so many ankle limitations because nope. of this movement pattern been there. that people have been, you know. Been there. I've had ankle issues myself. Again, it's 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 when I'm in situations with my job that that um uh, my ankles are forced to be in a bad position or in a position that I don't want them to be in. But because I have to, my uh my my ankles might be or my foot might be wedged between two pallets. But I have this case that I have to stick up here on the top shelf, you know, and I have to kind of contort myself, you know, to get it, you know, to get it up there again. But yeah, that's they're saying here too. If you put your body in unnatural positions, you're going to get injured. So, spreading a myth or trying to teach for the wrong reasons without letting them just move like athletes. Like, let your body move natural, and usually it does what it needs to do to be most efficient at whatever movement that is. Soreness is a sign. Nope. Uh, basically, soreness is a sign that you worked out. Or, uh, to be more specific, you're um you you did some kind of uh, repetitive motion that your body wasn't used to. I, I think it's called a delayed onset soreness, but uh, I've had it happen sooner. Um, I've, uh, but uh, I've worked in, uh, after working in one department, in my case, frozen dairy, or I work at Walmart, by the way, but anyway, working in one department for a long period of time, you just get used to it, the soreness goes away, but then all of a sudden, I might get put over here in this department, a department that's, that has totally different work requirements, you know, or different you know different motions i have to do during you know throughout the night doing you know moving and lifting things a different way than what i'm used to over here um i have called in sick from work because of this too i'll work in this totally different department but then the next day i'm oh, oh, oh i'm like sore as hell and i don't want to have to go into work sore so i end up having to call in so so it just means uh it just means you're you're moving in such a way that your body's not used to of a good workout. Soreness is basically when you have an accumulation of lactate in your blood. It turns your yourself into more of an acidic state, and that's when you kind of feel that burn effect that people talk about. Is soreness a, a factor of a workout? Yes, potentially. Our, our patients, our athletes have had plenty of great workouts and ha not felt sore the yep. next day, right? It's just the yep. way the body is, and sometimes you just have a harder workout, the shorter workouts, those 15, 20 minute workouts. Those are the ones that typically I don't personally feel too sore in. But if I get like a nice hour and 15 more yep. workout when I'm just going hard, body it, used I'm going to feel a little bit more sore the next day. But again, that doesn't mean that my 20 minute workout was ineffective or bad. Like a lot of people, they're like, oh, I can barely walk. I'm so sore. And their trainer is like, good. And I'm like, nope. that's not so good. Nope. Like, you should be able to walk. You should have been nope. progressed in a way that was so gradual that you are feeling stronger. And maybe you are still getting a little bit sore, but you don't feel like you can't walk the next day. I think rest and recovery, nutrition, sleep is super important. Bigger muscles are stronger. Nope. And I, I remember this one clearly. Um, I'm working with one now, but I'm now that I think about it, I've worked with my fair share of them over the years. Uh, we got a guy right now that I work with. He's, I'd say he's about five foot four, five foot five. He's shorter than I am, and the guy looks like a freaking toothpick. He's skinny as hell, but yet he can sit here and lift heavy with the rest of us all. He can sit here and grab his like four or five cases of. Oscar Mayer bologna and stuff like that. And just doo -doo -doo, carry him on down. So, but yeah, he's as strong as everybody else. So, from a physiology standpoint, bigger muscles may have the ability to be stronger. They could have bigger or more motor units to be able to get stronger, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they are stronger. There are people that have genetic differences. They have longer muscles and they're not gonna be like as like short or as prominent. So they maybe don't look as big, but they may be really, really strong because there's more of them and there's a shorter tendon where they're attaching. Or, you know, there's people that have different limb lengths. Your levers are gonna play into how strong you are. I do talk about um, size because obviously dealing with- I also wanna say uh, muscle density as well. I mean, again, my, my previous example, I mean, the guy's skinny as hell, but yet he's sitting there lifting heavy just like the rest of us. I mean, he don't look like no bodybuilder. Far from it. So yeah, I'm thinking muscle density must uh, probably plays a factor in there as well. So the rehab side of things, they have 
a post-op knee that looks like half the size of the other side. But I'm never like, oh, you're weak because you look like this. It's just, hey, let's get in the weight room. Let's get a little bit stronger. Let's make sure you can perform your sport safely, confidently, and all that kind of stuff. And for me, that's all I really care about is the more the performance side of things. Um, and getting stronger is, is going to help you in your performance. And there's also, a, there, there's also a bowling analogy in here, too. Yeah, because, I mean, it, it's kind of like bowling. Because, uh, I mean, basically all that matters is what your score is. It doesn't matter how you achieve it. Just it, as long as it looks good on paper. I mean, I've seen, uh, I mean, I've done my fair share of bowling, been in bowling leagues and whatnot, and I've seen people throw that ball in all kinds of different ways. I mean, I, I, can't, really, I can't really show it here, but I mean, I've seen, I mean, I've seen, I've seen people, I've seen people just simply just walk the ball like a suitcase. Just walk it down and just, just kind of, just, you know, not, they don't, you know, they don't do the full wind up or anything like that. But I mean, I saw one guy who just carries it like a suitcase and just basically just drops it on the club, drops it on the alley. And he scored three perfect 300 games doing this. Um, watched another bowler. He, I think he, um, he would just grab the ball like this. Do three, do three gentle steps, and just gently drop the ball, and it would take probably 10, 15 seconds for the ball to get there. But he's bowled perfect 300 games doing that. Um, and I've I've seen another. He was like a corn-fed Iowa country boy kind of guy. He was like six. I want to say he's like in the upper six foot range, almost seven feet tall, blonde, big old boy. Um, he had one of those bowling balls. That, uh, that have three holes, three finger holes. You stick your, instead of just two, you stick three, three fingers in there. He had one of those, but he was a 100% brute force bowler. He'd have the ball way up here. He'd drop it all the way down. And I mean, the ball would hit the pins in like maybe two seconds. Two seconds, if even that. But he's never, he's never gotten perfect 300 games doing it, but he has bowled in the above 200 doing that. So it's, So it, it's kind of it's kind of what he's saying to, saying here too. All that matters is your performance. It doesn't matter how whether or not you look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. All that matters is how well you do. So for the most part, you need to eat meat to build. Nope. Nope. Um, I was like this at one point. Um, I was still getting my daily protein. Um. Yeah, I wasn't. I don't. There was a time where I wasn't eating salmon or eating chicken chicken breast like I am now. But back in the day, most of my protein came from protein shakes, red kidney beans, lima beans. I think there was something else. I can't remember what. But yeah, there was a brief period of time where I was a vegetarian. And you can still get all the protein you need just, you know, just, again, just from eating beans. But eventually I phased them out. And started off, uh, started uh, eating salmon, tuna, and um, chicken breast. So, but yeah, there, that is definitely a myth right there. It it kind of, it sort of kind of goes back to my bowling analogy. Where you get the protein don't matter as long as you get it. So, muscle. <laughs> Your eyes got big there. Definitely not. You do need to eat protein to build muscle, but you do not need to get your protein from meat sources only. They have vegan protein shakes. You can do lentils. Even quinoa has protein in it. Cardio before weights. Um, I think I defer to them for this one. Um, but yeah, I'm not a I'm not a cardio person. I think they I think they talk about it later on. Talk about jogging. So I'll go ahead and answer it when that comes up. But otherwise, I'll just... What are your thoughts? So, it depends on your goals. Are your goals cardiovascular related? Or are your goals strength related? I think that that thing needs to be first. So if you're a strength athlete, you definitely need to make sure that you're focusing on what's important, which is your strength training. And this is not a black and white thing, just like a lot of things in the fitness world and rehab world that we work with. Cardio doesn't have to be what you think it is. It doesn't have to be biking or running or swimming. Like I do weightlifting as a form of okay. cardio because- Okay, I remember, I remember, I remember this. Um, I've, and I've, I've done this before too, back, at all. back when I first started working out, I was sitting there just 
piled on the weight. Ugh, dumbbell flies, just doing a, doing a dumbbell bench presses and all this other stuff. And I was like sweating the, I mean, I was like sweating. The heart rate was just, you know, just so you can, you can get a form of cardio by, by uh, lifting weights like she's talking about. So, but I met a, but uh, I was at a point where, uh, where the, uh, getting the hurts and always were starting to build up too. Cause again, I'm lifting weights at a time where I already, where I work a job where I already do a lot of heavy lifting. So, so yeah, I was pretty much overdoing it, but I definitely get what she was saying here too. Cause been there myself. I get my heart rate up and then I'm able to, to sustain that. And that alone is cardiovascular work. Working out tones your muscles. Okay. Um, this is kind of a, this is kind of confusing right here. No, working out makes your mouth, working out uh, strengthens and then, and, and as a byproduct, enlarges them. But it may, basically, this is a, the, the concept of bulk and cut are kind of confusing. I mean, I've heard, I mean, I've heard the, uh, the occasional question over the years, like, are you going for bulk or are you going for cut? Which just kind of leaves me going, what? So, but he, I think they say the same thing here too. Which, I can't even say that with a straight face because what is toning? I like, like think yep. of toning as something a printer does. I think when people think of tone, they think of seeing their muscles and it being like visible. And it always comes down to calories in versus calories out. And like being able to see your muscles means that you probably are in a caloric maintenance or deficit state. So you got to make sure you're really focusing on what you're eating too, not just focusing on what you're doing in the gym. There are plenty of runners out there who dread who dread lifting, um, but they're still mm -hmm. considered on the toner side, you know. And, and that's where the word tone is very very subjective. But there are other people who are on the more strength conditioning side who love to lift and are also toned. So again, mm -hmm. that's where the individuality really needs to come into play here. Absolutely. It's all going back yeah. to their goals. What are your goals? And for me, my goals are not as much aesthetic anymore as they are just, you know, feeling strong, being strong, and like being the best version of myself. Exercise cancels out. Un nope. And um, I just remember too, I was like this at one point. Um, I would sit here and, uh, I mean, I got a junk food addiction, but one of the ways that I tried to try to work around that was to actually try jogging. I'll explain more on that later on, the, on in this video. But um, I would sit here and I, I would sit here and lift more weights, pump more iron. You know, I would um, I would have a can, you know, I would have a couple donuts or something. But then afterwards, I would uh, I would throw some, or I would pick up my barbell or my dumbbells or something like that and just uh, start lifting more in order to try to get my body to burn more cal, to burn the calories that I just. That I just consumed with the donuts I ate, or something like that. But it it doesn't work that way, um, especially at my age, which I'm I'm 49 now. So the old you know the old engine don't work the way it used to. So it isn't like when you're a child, when you're a child, teenager, etc., where you can pretty much your metabolic rate, you can pretty much burn anything you eat. I mean, so which. Now that I think about it, it kind of reminds me of one of my coworkers that I talked about earlier. He was, he's like this. He's again, he's short. He's shorter than I am. He's five foot four, five foot five, um, and he's like super skinny. The I mean, the guy probably eats about as the, the guy probably eats about as bad as everybody else. Like he eats burritos and he eats unhealthy food, but yet I've never seen him get fat. And then um, at some point he became an alcoholic. Um, I think he's had at least one or two DUIs on his record. And so he's reduced to riding a bicycle now. But yeah, he's and he's literally stumbled into work drunk. We then the manager actually has had to send him home because he's too inebriated. And yet he's he he can sit here and just not not gain any weight at all. I'm kinda going off the subject here, but yeah, basically this is definitely a myth right here. Especially at my age. So I'm guessing my other coworker, he's probably probably like in his 20s or 30s or something. But, you know, he's he's not exactly at that advanced age where, again, I'm 49 years old, so, I mean, I can't, I mean, I could probably have one or, one or two donuts and 
my body ain't gonna do much about it because I'm stored as fat. Not, not him. I mean, the guy could probably literally eat a freaking horse and not gain a pound of weight. No, I'm jealous. But anyway. Healthy eating habits. Definitely not. <laughs> oh, insulin resistance. That, I still don't know the, I don't, I don't completely understand the definition, but basically, if your body has a lot of insulin resistance, your body also has a hard time processing food, especially junk food. So I think uh, insulin resistance is your body's way of saying, fuck it. You know, you eat, you eat six donuts, your body basically just says, you know, instead of having to go through the pain and hardship of having to process all that crap, it just says, fuck it. It just stores it as fat. That's how I'm understanding it. But again, I don't, I just looked, I just looked that term up like real briefly. So, but anyway, let me, let me move right along. 100% not. <laughs> My sister used to say this all the time. She'd be like, you know, I, I'm going to work out today so I can go to McDonald's. And I was like, yep. what? If you're eating lots of yep. saturated fats and processed food, it's not good for you. And she was like, but you know, I'm, I'm burning more than I'm consuming. Nope. Isn't that what matters at the end of the day? And I was like, not all yes, calories are created that's equally. Important but it's really comes down to like the things that you're putting inside your body that's gonna have a long-term effect. It's not just calories in versus calories out. Let's hit your macros in these different three areas, like the big protein, carbs, and fats, whatever that is for you. Can you have your occasional cheap burger and things like that? Of course you can. If I were to go- Um, it probably depends on mentality on that. Cause um, with me, it's a slippery slope. I think I mentioned this this morning, one of my uh, on my first attempt at making this this morning. Um, but a guy named Ross Zahabi, he he's um he's an MMA trainer. He owns his own gym out in Canada someplace. But he said the same thing too. Junk food is a slippery slope. And but you know, I think uh, the way he the way he said it, it it, it it's a sli it does the slippery slope doesn't have to be practically a 89 degree angle. <laughs> It could be this, it could be, theoretically, it could be a 1% or a 1 degree. A very slow, you know, a very, you know, a very slow slope, a very shallow one. That's the situation that I was in because when I went on my week-long junk food binge, um, I basically went back right after not wanting to go through that again. I went back to my old junk food habits. But over time, over time, I started eating more and more junk food. But it wasn't just, it wasn't just a sudden, sudden every day just going all out, picking out or anything like that. It happened over time. You know, and some odd months later, eat a little more junk food than normal every day. And then some odd months later on down the road, eat even more, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I kind of I understand what he's saying here too. Yeah, the occasional burger or donut here is okay. But uh, it also depends on mentality. I probably have what um. I probably have the same thing that um I guess Miles Davis has, what's called an addictive personality. We, we don't do moderation. I mean, if we if we have a donut that we like, we're eating more. We're eating more of those donuts. We're not like other people where uh they can like. They can smoke a cigarette and then. Not touch it again. No, they're they're they're. I mean, if they like that nicotine, they're having at least a pack a day, that kind of thing. Those are addictive personalities. I have it. Miles Davis has it. I mean, we're basic. We're the mentality-wise, we're the go big or go home people. So, but I mean, but again, I understand what he's saying here. Too. I mean, you know, the occasional cheat here is okay, um, if if you have the mind to handle it. Whereas again, uh, Miles Davis didn't have it. I mean. He was super addicted to heroin, super addicted to cocaine, but he he basically went all in on these. He didn't just, you know, he didn't, oh, occasional shot of heroin once in a while here and there. No, he was in it all the way. Balls deep, baby. So, I'm same way with junk food. I eat fast food, whatever one it is, for 14 of my lunch and dinners, then and I could lift two hours a day, that would not necessarily help me. You should bulk and cut to build muscle. Okay, this, this is what I was talking about earlier. It's very confusing terms. You know, you, you know, you're asking for, 
bodybuilding advice. Are you going for bulk or are you going for cut? You know, what? You know, I, to me, they're one and the same. I have done a stint of bodybuilding and I know that this is something that I used to also believe before I became more knowledgeable on the subject. Usually bodybuilders, they will bulk up just to put on some muscle and then they will cut down so then they can see that muscle and Water. see what that muscle looks like. Water now, deprivation. if your goal is not to be a bodybuilder and you wanna bulk and cut simultaneously, you can do that, but you have to be in a positive nitrogen state in your body. And the way that you can achieve that is by increasing your protein, which in the form of amino acids, and also adding in creatine and then making sure you're sleeping enough. It's not easy oh, like good putting luck. on good luck, you know, mass and then taking off mass because then like you're like, man, I look so good when I'm cutting, but then I feel terrible when I look in the mirror when I'm bulking and it just throws you into this like emotional state of like not feeling good about yourself. I see that in some of my patients too. And they don't know how to kind of return back to normal eating because they've been in either one or the other for so long. I think that for people who are really trying to you know, be structured and, and rigid with this. There is so much help out there. There, I know Stacy takes on online clients and things like that. To do it in a safe, productive, structured way, you need to work out for at least an nope. hour. Nope. And I remember this one clearly this morning too. Nope. Um, it's all about the burn. However you get that burn, it don't matter. As long as, as long as you're not getting injured in the process, then it, as long as you're, as long as your muscles are getting some kind of burn. You'll get it. I got a good, I mean, I got a good, I got a good chunk of my strength just by working. I didn't have to go to a gym and sit here, urgh, urgh, you know, hit the weights or anything like that. I could have just gone to my heavy lifting job and just sit here and lift, and just lift, lift cases of Del Monte tomato sauce, and like a whole pallet over, you know, to this, this person over here that's going to put them all up here on the shelf to be made into a display later or something just doing nothing but that but yeah i'm sitting here i'm building strength i'm building muscle just by doing this so i mean it, it kind of a related yet unrelated but as far as like a one hour minimum no <clears throat> in fact there was a book that i was reading um back in like the 90s called heavy duty a guy named mike benzer he's a legendary bodybuilder but excuse me his whole philosophy was basically efficiency. He basically said what I'm saying. It's all about the burn. But um, he was more of a strict, rigid, one set to failure. Like you would do, you would do one warm up set, and then the next set you do is set up to is set up to positive failure in six to ten reps. Where in six between reps six and ten, you just you can't lift it up anymore. And then that, and then. They called it good on that. They called it good on that exercise. Basically, you're only gonna be in the gym for like 15 minutes. So, no. In fact, uh, if you're if you're there for at least an hour, I would say either either A, you're just fucking around part of the time, or B, you're gonna get injured because you're if you're working off for an hour, you're you're pretty much tearing yourself up at that point. For it to have an effect. Please go ahead and rip that one up as well. I'm a big believer in working smarter, not harder. Yeah, but, and okay, that's what I was about to say. Um, Athlean X, I, I forget the guy's name, but uh, I think he was saying the same thing too. Um, it's all about the burn. Whether it's one set to failure, or you do many different sets, is but they're all going to lead to the same result. It's, it's all about burning the muscles. So, shorter doesn't mean not effective. The ACSM, they have those like minimum effective dosage numbers for like adults, right? Over the course of the week, you have to accumulate that many minutes of moderate intensity for it to be considered effective for your cardiovascular health. And then if it's vigorous activity, I think it's 75 minutes to 150 minutes. So it's even smaller. Can you only survive on 20, 30, 30 minute workouts? Yeah, you can, yep. but I think that obviously you can get significantly more done in a little bit more time, which is I think the hour time frame. Running will destroy your knee. Um, okay, this is uh, part. This is the part that I was having to talk about. Um, I have tried jogging before, um, but I think uh, I think it depends on uh, how you run too. Like, um, I mean, lots of other joggers that I've seen. I mean, they 
I mean, they, they ain't gonna have any knee problems at all, because they, you know, they're, you know, their, their legs are pretty close to the ground, they're just, whereas, uh, I'm more of a plotter. Whereas, I'm, I'm more, I mean, my knees are like, way, my knees are like way the hell up here, and, you know, so I don't have a, I don't have a, I don't have this really elegant gazelle form or anything like that. Whereas uh, I bit, ba I'm basically like an elephant doing ballet or something. Just got to, and then um, but that's for the rare time that I actually run. My biggest weakness are my calves, cause uh, doing too much of that, both of my calves will just quack, like they'll rip, they'll rip, and then uh, it hurts like hell to walk after that. So. That's my big issue. But yeah, I have I have tried jogging before. But as far as destroying your knees, I guess that would probably depend on how you do it. It, it was what I was trying to say here a few moments ago. Like some, I mean, some people can sit there and just jog and not ever, it, it's almost like they're, it's almost like their legs are completely straight when they do it. Whereas, I mean, this is pretty much how I jog. I'm more of a plotter, more of a stomper, which again, that's probably one of, might be one of the reasons why it screws up my calves. Although, if I actually did try to, you know, try to, you know, try to jog like everybody else does, it's just gonna postpone the inevitable. Because, like I said, my biggest weakness are my calves, because they rip fairly easily. So, but um, let's see what up. I can't remember what you can they rip said. that one up too. Even though I hate running personally, it will not destroy your knees. I don't know who made that up or when that became a thing, but it's definitely not backed by any scientific research. And I know I've read some recent studies actually show that runners have thicker density of their cartilage and their ligaments. So actually running helps their knees. It does not hurt your knees. Yeah, we talk about how strength training helps to build resiliency in your tissues and running is the same. I, I... <laughs> Jeez. And I'm guessing that some of the pictures they're showing, like in those weird contortionist positions, it's got to be him. That's got to be this guy here. I think they showed another, another pic, another picture of him, like doing a handstand. It looked like he's about to start doing handstand push-ups or something. But holy shit, is this guy flexible? I, I was laughing when I read this, just because I grew up playing basketball. Running is involved in basketball. I work with a lot of soccer and lacrosse players. They have to run. And I can promise you that all their knees are not destroyed. I think that the people who do have pain with running, that probably means that their body and their tissues just aren't used to whatever the capacity they're doing. Yep. It's more of, did you start? And again, that, and again, um, the kind of jogging that I did probably would, probably would hurt my knees. Cause again, I'm a, I'm a stomper, not a, I'm a stomper, not a, not a jogger. But, uh, but, sorry to sound like a broken record. Again, my biggest weakness are my calves. Once they rip, it's over. You know, progressing your mileage too fast, bumping up your intensity of other things too fast, and your body wasn't ready for it. Did you change your shoes recently, and now your foot has to move in a different way? Like, all of those little things kind of add up. The best way to burn fat is on an M. Um, I'll, def I'll probably definitely defer, defer to these guys, but, uh, there was a period of time when uh when I was when I was on my weight loss campaign, I was around I was around between I was around 150. I took up intermittent fasting. But one of the things I write about that is um it's actually best to work out in a fasted state. The they they got real scientific and technical like something called mTOR. I have, I don't know what they're talking about there, but but um, I my uh, my theory on that is um, if you're on an empty stomach, or basically if your body doesn't have to digest slash process any food, then that frees it up to do other things like building and repairing muscle and I guess burning fat here that kind of thing. But um, okay, I can kind of see what they're talking about here. Um, So it sounds like here you have to be in a caloric deficit. Your body, your your body has to be in a position where it has to consume fat. 
Oh. Okay, that... I'm trying to remember here. I don't remember where I read it, but somebody said your liver... Your liver is your refrigerator. Your your gut is your freezer. If, um... If you have nothing in your refrigerator, then, yeah, you you force your body to have to go with the... Go with what's in your freezer here. So, be... So, just a mere empty stomach isn't going to cut it. I mean, did you eat like a freaking pig before that point? If you did, I mean, that, you ain't going to burn shit. Because uh, your body's still along. Your body's still going through what you got in your liver here. So, I mean, you got to you gotta empty this out first before the body starts emptying this out. So, now, again, but but again, this is... um. But this is something that I I read about when um when uh, when fasting is that again they they get technical but my theory on it is, is if your body doesn't have to process any food then yeah then it's free to do other stuff like I guess burning fat and building muscle but anyway oh the stomach uh yeah go ahead and crinkle that up and throw that one away as well <laughs> here I got big things. So this is one of those ones I used to believe too, that they've come out with a bunch of new studies to show that no, you do not have to do fasted cardio to burn fat. Obviously, like if you're in a caloric deficit, you're in a caloric deficit, but then you're gonna be burning fat. It's more like what kind of workouts are you doing? What heart rate zone are you in? And then what does your nutrition look like? The intensity probably matters as well. We train a lot of these high school and college level athletes and they're coming in, they're sprinting, they're cutting, they're lifting. We typically recommend them eating something before they come in, like even if it's like a granola bar or something like that. Eating breakfast is fine. Not eating breakfast, if you don't want to eat breakfast, it's also fine. Um, and I actually get a mixture of opinions on this. Um, some say, some say timing is important when you when you have your food. Like you don't want to eat a lot just before you lay down, as though like your your whole digestive system like shuts down when you're sleeping or something like that. Um. And then there's those that uh, and I'm, I'm still kind of, I'm still kind of in the middle on this. But there's others that say, when you ha when you consume your calories, doesn't matter. All that matters is is how many. So based on that, you can sit there and just pig out all you want just before you lay it on. Your body's still gonna digest it all. But again, I'm kind of in the middle. Like, like uh, I do have a cutoff. Like I don't, I try not to, I try not to eat anything. And I try not to drink any of these, like, like two hours before I lay down. But uh, my main issue is actually heartburn, not, not calorie reasons. Cause um, and I've done that before. I used to just <laughs> just chow down, like, and then, then end up having to lay down shortly after, and I end up with big time heartburn, cause of all that food I ate. So, so I mean that that that's I mean that's the reason why I do that, is. I don't, you don't want. I don't want heartburn. I don't want to. I don't want to end up being. I don't want to end up being rudely awakened because of heartburn. So yeah, I have that two-hour cutoff. So. But just make sure you're eating what you need to be eating and getting the nutrients you need to get throughout your day. Lifting heavy weights at a young age will stunt your. Um. If you're at a, I would probably say if you're at a super young age, like ten years old or something, I could probably see it. But, um, I mean, I had my first, I got my first job at 17 years old. And again, it, it wasn't stunning my growth or, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't super injuring myself or anything like that. I was getting stronger. I mean, I was getting, I was getting bigger and all that from all the heavy lifting I was doing. And I was doing this when I was about 17 years old. So as far as that goes, myth. Growth. I, I think that, Stacey, you, know, you and I would both agree. <laughs> You and I will both agree that this is something that maybe we grew up on. There's no evidence to support that viewpoint that lifting weights is going to stunt your growth. I've looked into it because I started lifting at a younger age. I'm actually, you know, pretty tall for a gymnast. I think strength training does play a, a, a big role in youth sports and keeping them healthy and keeping them okay. strong. And I also think I people see what they mean automatically here. Yeah. assume that strength training means that you're lifting extreme heavy weights when that's not the case. Like. Up Wait, I gotta rewind that back. Keeping a bit. them healthy and keeping them strong. Because I started lifting at a younger age. I'm actually, you know, 
pretty tall for a gymnast. I think strength training does play a, a, a big role in youth sports and keeping them healthy and keeping them strong. And I also think people automatically assume that strength training means that you're lifting extreme heavy weights when that's not the case. Like picking up a three to five pound weight is considered weight training and strength training. Assisted exercises are not as a... Um, pull-ups. I remember this one too. Um, I really wish I could take up doing pull-ups, but there's, there's nothing in my apartment and there's nothing, nothing nearby that I can use as a pull-up bar. But, um, but no, um, for those that have, for those that can't do a single pull-up, do negative pull-ups. The kind where you grab a ladder, you climb up the ladder and you, you actually, instead of, uh, instead of trying to pull your, hang on. Instead of trying to pull yourself up, you actually start in the top position and then you you drop yourself down. You just do the negative part of that lift, the lowering. But I'm, I'm assuming that's what they're meaning here. But no, assisted exercises can be effective. Again, sometimes they're necessary. Like in my case, I can't do a single pull up to save my life, but I could probably do, I could probably do a negative or two though. But again, I'm kind of theorizing here. Again, I have no access to a pull-up bar. Effective. My immediate thought is not as effective as what? Does assisted mean that you're just getting some help? Or does it mean that you're using bands? Maybe a lot of- Oh, another thing. Speaking of negatives. Um, again, sometimes assisted exercises are mandatory. Like uh, if you're say doing bench presses and if you're trying to do what are called, I believe, forced negatives. Where, or where all you're doing are uh, negatives. For, for those who don't know, um, there's three parts of a lift. Uh, positive, static, negative. Positive is the lifting part of the, is the actual lifting part of the lift. Static is the, is the holding it there part of the lift, the apex of it. The negative is the lowering of the weight. The l positive is the least effective, is the least effective part of that lift. Static is is in the middle, is in the middle, more effective than positive, but not as effective as negative. And then, there, then there's negative, the most effective part of the lift. So, but um, going back going back to what I was trying to say is, uh, there's actually, uh, sometimes these assisted exercises are mandatory. Negatives are one of them. Because you can put a crap ton of weight on that bar for, for, the, for the negative part of the lift. With that kind of weight, you're most certainly gonna need some. You're gonna need some assistance. You know, somebody there just to help you lift the damn thing up. And so, and then and you'll need some help because in case of you know you can't handle the weight and, and then yeah, you're gonna need that buddy to lift it off you. So. People have a hard time doing pull-ups, and they use a band. But does that mean um, that they're not getting stronger? I couldn't. That because they're using a band? No. It just means that at their current level, they need a band to be able to perform the movement. Sometimes we do assisted mobility work. So you, we use like a, a band to assist in doing this specific position. It's actually going to help us in the long run by using some assistance right now. It all comes down to what's the goal of the exercise. Like, are we trying to, you know, get more mobility or get stronger? Because yeah, sometimes using assistance is what we need to use. You can't exercise with flat feet. Uh, this is just plain silly. Yeah. This is so silly. Oh my gosh. There's like half of the- No, but I remember uh, kind of on a related yet unrelated note here. Let me. People in the world that have flat feet, they're not supposed to exercise. I'm, I'm done. I'm done. I, I, I quit. <laughs> you definitely can exercise with flat feet. I, along with hundreds of thousands of other people, millions of other people have, have been able to do it. And I think it's also kind of funny that a lot of people still believe that you can change your foot shape and your, your arch of your foot. If you okay, here's where I stopped it. Um, I think over in China, they had a they had some kind of ritual. They they um they did to the uh, Chinese women over there. They would um if they had arches, they would act they would actually I don't. I'm trying to remember I'm trying to remember what exactly they use, but they will break the arches on their feet in order to flatten their feet. So, but like I said, I don't know the exact. I just remember reading or hearing about it when I was a kid. But yeah, it, but yeah, it kind of kind of goes along with what she was saying here too. Like you can't you can change the shape of your foot. But yeah, they're they're breaking the arches in China. So. 
you have flat feet. Like your foot structure kind of is how it is. And yes, we can get our like the arch of our foot stronger so then you can have better stability overall, but you can't change the structure of your foot. At the end of the day, all of these myths that we talked about today, they are because of extremes. Don't be afraid to question things. If someone's telling you that you indefinitely have to do it. If you start believing that myth and now telling someone else, this is how myths kind of circulate and travel. Yep. And yep. It, yep. And the internet, the internet really exasperated this. I mean, if you're, if you're telling one guy, a, if you're telling one guy a complete crock of shit, that guy be like, whoa, never heard of that before. I totally agree with that. Yeah, yeah, oh, it makes total sense. <laughs> and then he goes on Twitter and he spreads that around and then, you know, then the bullshit just spreads like crazy. So, and then, yeah, so totally get what they're saying. Uh, but, but anyway, that's going to be it for the video. And, and it, this definitely went off, this definitely went off way better than this morning's attempt. And once again, uh, for those, for those that don't know, I tried to do a, I tried to do this very same video this morning, but it came out terribly. I was just saying all the wrong things. I was getting, you know, just doing a lot of hemming and hawing and, and just, when I, when I played that video back, I was just, I was just sitting there just face palm. I'm like crazy. Like, what the hell did you say that for, Joe? Oh my God. It's like, but yeah. So this definitely came out much better than last time. So, but otherwise, well, just got to go ahead and call it good here. And looks like I'm going to have to run out and do some grocery shopping. So got to get in there before the stores close, preferably an hour beforehand. Because I don't want to be that guy, you know, that... That hangs out, pass, hangs out after the store is closed, you know, pissing everybody off, making everybody wait on them. So, so, but, but anyway, thanks for uh, tuning in and listening to me, everybody. I appreciate that, and take care, and see you all next time.